so welcome to this uh, webinar around um, myopic and maculopathies uh, with Professor Jeremy Guggenheim, who I will introduce shortly. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Colin Daniels, and I'm the Working Age and Young People Service Manager for the Macula Society. Uh, I've been working for the, for the organisation for nearly six years. I started as a regional manager here in the Central East. Um, I, I sort of based in Norwich, and I, just to make you gloat a little bit, it's about 26 degrees outside at the moment, so it's very lovely. Uh, so and we've um, sort of decided with the whole load of COVID and coronavirus and all of that stuff, we're all a bit stuck, can't get out, and can't get around and about doing our jobs. Um, so how do we make people more aware of various different conditions? Um, and I felt that this might be a way forward. So it's a really, I'm really excited to have this first one today. Um, I, I'm going to ask her if there's a few sort of little rules. So if you can, you, you can't unmute yourself. I've got control of that. Um, uh, also, if you can relieve your cameras off, that would be fantastic please, as well. Um, during uh, Jeremy's talk, uh, you will be able to message him and ask him questions. Uh, so the chat feature is open. So if you've got any questions, just please send them through there. They're only going to come to the hosts, um, and uh, so and then we can uh, we'll deal with them at this end. So what I'm trying to say basically is you can't message each other. It's not like passing notes in a classroom. Um, so on the on the group to, on the meeting today, uh, there's uh, Geraldine Hode, who's the research manager of the Macula Society. So do you want to say hi, Jerry? You need to unmute yourself. Oh. Hello, hello, sorry, just <laughs> I'm unmuting myself there. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to see so many of you. Brilliant, excellent. Well, we'll have a chat with you, Jerry, later at the end, just to sort of explain a bit more about what the, the Macula Society does for, with its research and how we fund it a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Perfect. Cheers. Um, and then just so you know, before I introduce Jeremy, um, there's, there'll be a voice, uh, a, a disembodied voice uh, that will turn up occasionally and her name is Patience and she's my support worker um, and she is going to sort of be, well she described it as flying the plane today, so she's pressing all the clever buttons and doing all the whiz bang stuff. Um, and so occasionally you might just hear her voice, so that's her. Um, also, um, if you hear Woody, he's my guide dog, I think he's um, sound asleep at the moment, which is great. Um, but he, he might start padding about as well, just in the odd noises. So, so there we go. Now, uh, so here we are, we're going to talk about myopia today. Um, so we're going to talk to uh, Professor uh, Jeremy Guggenheim, who is from the Car uh, Cardiff University. Um, he, he's been working in this field for, for many years um, and, and does lots and lots of research in the area into genetics and all sorts, which he, he will tell you much, much more about than I will. Um, if you could, uh, you know, as I say, direct questions to him. Uh, so, uh, so Jeremy, uh, over to you. You have to unmute yourself, Jeremy. Oh, that's great. Oops. Thanks very much. I've just gone to the end of my talk, so I'll just <laughs> rectify that. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. There we go. Um, oh, still not. I think, sorry. Um, sorry about this. That's. That's all right. There we go. So thanks very much for the invitation to speak to you today. It's really exciting from my point of view. I don't often get the chance to speak to um, societies like this. So I'm really uh, happy to have the chance. Um, just a bit of background. I'm an optometrist by training. And as Collins mentioned, I've been um, doing research in myopia for about 20, 25 years primarily focusing on genetics and epidemiology. So I thought it'd be nice to split the talk into, into chunks. So I'll start off talking about some general features of myopia, then talk a little bit about myopia research happening around the world at the moment, and then just finish the rest time on one particular study, 
we've been doing in Cardiff. And so as many as you will know, uh, myopia is primarily a condition due to excessive elongation of the eye, so we call this the axial length, and whereas in a typical eye, light will come to fo uh, focus on the retina, at the back of the eye, in myopia, the light comes to a focus in front of the retina because the eye has become too long. So that leads to the um, characteristic blurred vision, but it's this elongation of the eye that is um, responsible for most of the um, disease aspects of myopia. So we can correct myopia or correct the blurred vision from myopia by using a spectacle lens or contact lenses or laser refractive surgery and that will um, diverge the light before it gets into the eye so bringing the focus onto the retina so you can get sharp vision but it's important to realize that this is just correcting the symptoms the blurred vision and um, because it's not addressing the elongation of the eye itself it doesn't reduce the risk of um, sight loss um, due to myopia. So the next picture you can see a crop sectional view through the retina and the layers below below that. So we can see this this is the retina this uh, area above the um, the high intensity uh, lines here. And we can see this characteristic dip um, in the macular region. So what's happening in myopia as we get a little bit of thinning in the retina, um, considerable thinning in the choroid layer beneath the retina, and that layer provides the retina with nutrients and oxygen, and then below that, and not really visible well on this picture, is a layer of tissue called when you look at somebody's eye, that's the sclera is the white of the eye that provides happen in uh, myopia. The sclera starts to thin, um, allowing the eye to stretch and um, elongate. We then get this choroidal change, and then finally the retina seems to stretch to try and keep the enlarged surface area covered. Um, this is a different view of a an eye uh, with myopia. And this is the sort of view we take using a photograph. So we shine light into the eye through the pupil and take an image of the reflected light coming back. So we can see this red. This is the macular region again which in this patient looks at his nerves and blood vessels enter and leave the eye. And you can see on the surface of the retina, these red, thin red lines there, arteries and veins feeding the, the superficial layers of the retina again with nutrients and oxygen. And the characteristic feature we see in a lot of patients with myopia is this region to the side of the optic disc, which has this whitish color and a blackish gray model appearance. And that's called a myopic crescent. And that is an area where the retina here has been pulled away from the optic disc edge. So normally the retina comes right up close to the edge of the optic disc, but here you can see it's pulled away. And that's because as the eye has grown um, bigger in, in three dimensions, the retina has been stretched. And again, you can see some of the blood vessels are very have very really straight trajectories, which is unusual. Again, as a feature of the retina having been stretched as the eyes grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Here's another image from a different patient. Um, again, you can see a myopic crescent. And unfortunately, this patient has some new blood vessel growth in the macular region um, and nutrients. There's a stimulus for new blood vessels to sprout and grow. And unfortunately, these new blood vessels are very prone to leaking. So we get these little hemorrhages lying within the retinal tissue and they can have very um, adverse consequences on 
high resolution vision. And unfortunately, as they heal, they sometimes form a scar on the retina, which leads to permanent um, poor vision in that area. And then finally, another image. Um, this patient has a thin retina compete thinning of the corridge layer. And indeed, there's an area unfortunately situated on the macular region, which again, it's like somebody's taken a hole punch to the retina and punched out a disc of retina. This is usually because the corridor underneath. Jeremy, um, do you think we can down the scan? Nothing, so the retina lying on top can't get it. I beg your pardon, sorry? Can we go back to the OCT scans? It just, it just dropped out a bit when you were talking in that area. Yes. Yeah, and just try and speak up a little bit, please. So in the OCT, this provides a cross-sectional view through the retina and some of the layers below. So we can see a little bit of the choroid here and the sclera beneath that. So in, in myopic eyes, typically we get um, about a 50% reduction in the thickness of the sclera. Um, often the choroid becomes... Thinning of the retina um, there. Just coming back to this, this last um, image I have of um, the overview of the retina. Um, in this case, this um, punched out appearance is due to degeneration. White. Um, high intensity light regions below where the sclera is showing through. So I don't know if anybody has any questions so far. Okay. Any questions? Um, can you... Lots of comments. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, we've got lots of comments. Yes. <laughs> you just want to tell me a couple? Mm. Oh yeah, the um, the the internet is um, some of the some of the images have not been quite clear because the, uh, the the your the internet connection with so many people on has been a bit um, patchy. Um, so do you, do you, uh, do you want to continue and then we can um, sort of go through some of the questions for in in a, in, in a few more come through I think. Yes, and I, I see somebody's just asked a question about how myopic do you need to be to get this CNV change? Yeah. And in general, um, there's no particular threshold, but it is the case that the more severe the degree of myopia, unfortunately, the more likely the CNV is to develop. And again, it depends. Some patients will add more towards a CNV form of um, maculopathy, other patients. Uh, tend to go in a different route. So it's at the moment, um, ophthalmologists have very little um, to go on in, in deciding which patients are at highest risk of CNV, unfortunately. A couple of questions that, that we got um, through to us before, um, as we were opening the, the webinar was um, questions about if, if somebody has the condition in one eye, uh, is it likely to move to the other? Um, again, in general, it is yes, but as is the case with most eye conditions, there's a lot of um, variation from person to person. So some people will just have one eye very badly affected, but in general, um, the two eyes tend to have a time lag, but eventually do tend to follow the same course. So again, somebody who's had a CNV in one eye, for example, would need to be particularly on the watch for distortion in their vision, for example, for their other eye. Okay. Great. And, um, and, and another question, I know we, we touched on this before we started, but a couple, we had a couple of questions through um, around cataract. Do these have any effect? Yes, um, cataract typically 
when a cataract develops, the lens inside the eye becomes more dense. So that means the refracting properties of the crystalline lens increase. So cataract itself can be a cause of myopia. Um, but in that particular instance, extracting the cataract through routine cataract operation will tend to um, reverse that. Um, but the other thing about cataracts is there's um, some, I wouldn't say controversy, but some evidence that without the cataract there, more of the harmful um, UV light gets to the retina and that potentially could uh, accelerate macular degenerative changes there. So people who've had a cataract operation, uh, nowadays they often fit a, a replacement intraocular lens that has a filter to try and cut down on that um, ultraviolet light getting as far as the retina. Yeah, a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, are there any lifestyle changes that can delay the condition? Um, so uh, patients have got another question, which was, are there any lifestyle changes that people can make to um, reduce the progression? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the next section. Perfect. So, Brilliant. Shall I carry on to that now? Yes, please. Yeah, thanks. thanks. I need to share my screen at the moment. <laughs> Are you struggling to share your screen, Jeremy? I think that. There we go. Sorry yeah. about that again. So um, in terms of topics of myopia research that are being studied at the moment, um, I've split those into three groups. So the first one I'll mention very, very briefly is um, treatment for existing uh, high degree myopia, maculopathy. Um, that's partly because compared to conditions like AMD, there's very little research in this area um, in general. Most of the research um, in terms of clinical trials to test new treatments, is borrowing treatments that have worked well in conditions like AMD and finding out if they're effective also in patients who have um, myopic macular disease. So for example, for myopic CNV, anti-VEGF injections um, seem to perform well in the same way they can preserve vision in, in wet AMD and similarly, photodynamic ther therapy um, also seems to be quite successful, perhaps even a little bit more successful than it has been in wet AMD. Um, for other kinds of um, myopic maculopathy, then sometimes surgery can be helpful for um, situations where there's a bit of scarring or traction in the macular region. But unfortunately, if, if the macula has degenerative changes due to myopia then in the same way that dry AMD has been very very difficult for um, ophthalmologists to develop treatments for. It's the same in the case of myopic maculopathy but at the moment there really isn't a lot of um, success in trying to treat that. Um, I should also mention that um, my own research hasn't really um, focused on treatment, so I'm probably not, wouldn't consider myself an expert in that particularly. Um, so going on to um, research into what causes myopia, then these can be split into animal studies and clinical studies in humans. So in animals, a wide range of species have been used. And the key finding really is that if you raise a young animal with a spectacle lens covering one eye, then that's going to again diverge the light entering the eye so that it focuses 
behind the retina. And what will happen is that the rate of growth of the eye will accelerate until the retina grows sufficiently to get a sharp image back, and then the rate of eye growth returns to normal. And the opposite happens if an animal's weird wearing a uh, converging lens in front of the eye, which focuses light in front of the retina, that will slow the rate of eye growth during development, and you end up with a shorter eye again that grows into focus. So it seems that this excessive eye growth we see in myopia, it's not a, a passive side effect phenomena. It seems the eye is actively trying to grow larger, something about modern lifestyle that children are growing up in is signaling the eye that it needs to grow longer and yet it doesn't get this signal that it's already grown too much. So the, uh, a bit like diabetes is probably due to our lifestyle and diet, myopia is probably due to something to do with our lifestyle but we're not really sure what that is. So animal studies are useful for looking at biochemical pathways and signals that regulate normal eye growth and this excessive growth we see in, in myopia. And also they're good for developing and testing new treatments. Uh, clinical studies in children, um, you can either use uh, those to try and identify these lifestyle risk factors, or we've also done a lot of work um, looking at the role of genetics in myopia. When looking at um, risk factors, you really need to uh, study um, samples of children over their childhood at the age when myopia typically develops. Um, and the key findings from these, is, I think somebody's asking a question a moment ago about risk factors, the two really strong risk factors we've identified so far are insufficient spent, uh, time spent outdoors and in randomized control, tr control trials, those have shown that um, spending more time outdoors can reduce um, development of myopia and something to do with near work, near viewing, reading and years spent in education also seems to be an important risk factor and I'll touch on that in the last part of the talk. As regards genetics there's been um, a lot of work in this area and around 900 different gene variants have been identified now that confer susceptibility to myopia, so make people predisposed to get the condition. And as well as that, in families that um, have a lot of people affected by very high degree myopia, and there's been some success in pinning down uh, gene variants that have a very big effect in that particular family, but these tend to be rare in the population at large. Moving on finally to attempts to try and slow progression of myopia. Um, there's been a lot of clinical studies showing that a drug called atropine is effective. This is something that can be administered through eye drops and to children. Uh, that can slow the progression of myopia by 50% uh, or even more in some studies. It depends on the concentration of the drops that are used. Um, if you use a low dose, you tend to get low side effects, the side effects being um, blurred vision and uh, susceptibility to bright lights because the pupil becomes enlarged. And unfortunately, there's also a bit of rebound. When the treatment is stopped, if a child's been taking high dose atropine, their myopia sometimes tend to accelerate when they stop the treatment. But using lower doses, that tends not to happen so much. Therefore, a lot of the work currently is trying to find an optimal dose that has a, a good enough efficacy but doesn't produce too much rebound or side effects. There are also now optical means of slow myopia progression. There are contact lenses available um, across the world that can reduce progression by around 50%. And glasses have just been launched in Asia and should be available in Europe uh, anytime soon. Um, so 50% slowing, I've illustrated here. So we've got a graph with age of the child on the x-axis and degree of refractive error getting worse as you go down the y-axis. The red curve here is 
um, a hypothetical child who hasn't received any treatment. And by the time the myopia stabilizes, getting up to the minus six, minus seven doctor region, if we can slow myopia around 50%, that could be cut down perhaps to around three or four diopters. Um, there is a caveat that so far clinical trials for these kind of treatments typically only last one, two, occasionally three years. So there's some uncertainty whether these treatment effects do continue if the child continues to use them throughout childhood. That's an important uh, aspect that uh, people need to look at further. But even changing from say, three or four doctor degree of myopia compared to a seven or eight doctor because the risk of baculopathy is rises exponentially with this degree of refractive error that will really substantially reduce uh, blindness and visual impairment hopefully if we can get more and more children being treated in this way Have we got any questions for, for Jeremy? Um, so we have one question. Uh, what is the upper age limit for the, these treatments to slow myopia? Yeah, that's a great question. The, if I can answer it the other way, the ideal age is to start as young as possible, I think, because the rate of progression, that is the number of doctors you change in any one year, is highest when myopia first starts. So around six, seven, eight will be the ideal age to start as soon as the child is recognized as being short-sighted. Um, but the treatment should potentially work um, even as children get older. And indeed it'd be interesting, it hasn't yet been tried in adults, but people who are highly short-sighted, they often still progress even into adulthood. And it might be that these treatments would again slow down their progression because again if you can keep somebody perhaps at minus six compared to getting on to minus 10 minus 20 that could indeed be um, a very useful outcome are there any of these treatments available for adults um not um to the best of my knowledge um again the the key age that most researchers are focusing on is childhood, just because that's the age when progression is greatest. And so if you can slow down progression during that period, then the ultimate amount of myopia anybody will develop will be that much less. Once you're an adult, you're often already close to the value you're going to stabilize at um, in later life. So although it, I think it's very worthwhile to try these um, therapies in, in adults, I think in terms of trying to reduce myopic maculopathy, I think children are the real target age. That's where I think as a public health intervention, this would have a, a big potential benefit. Um, there seems to be a lot of chat, Jeremy, about what can people of an adult age do? Really, um, rather than for younger people? Yes, for, for adults, um, in terms of slowing myopia progression, as I say, there's no research evidence that um, I can tell you about to change behavior there. But in terms of macular health, then the same things that you hear about as regards A and D, those are probably um, often pertinent to myopic maculopathy as well. So things like a, a healthy diet, um, exercise, not smoking, those risk factors, although it's a bit of a leap to apply them to myopic maculopathy, I think it's certainly plausible that those will, will help. Um, but again, unfortunately, the, the research evidence in this area is much, much more limited for myopia than it is for AMD. One of the questions that we got in before um, before the event today uh, was around nutrition. Uh, is that the same sort of advice that, that's given around AMD with that with that crossover? Yes, um, I'd certainly agree with that. Again, unfortunately, 
that's another area where there isn't much research as there, there is in AMD. Um, people have also looked at nutrition during childhood, and um, particularly vitamin D has been a hot topic because of spending time outdoors being a protective factor. People have wondered whether it's the lack of vitamin D from not being outdoors, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So as far as nutrition in childhood goes, we think it could be important, but nobody's been able to pin down anything consistently that, that I can tell you about, unfortunately. Perfect. Well, uh, any, any other questions we can get back to uh, people later? Okay, thank you. So if we move on to the to the math bottles talk, I'll just talk about one study we did in Cardiff in collaboration with researchers at Bristol, and that's regarding the link between education and myopia, and specifically whether education is a causal risk factor for myopia. Um, and that issue may seem um, a bit minor, but really uh, it, it is crucial. For example, the silly scenario I've got here is imagine that somebody does a study to find out whether the ability to use chopsticks is associated with myopia. And if somebody looks at a multi-ethnic sample of children, they might well find that kind of association because we know that children of Chinese ethnicity are much more likely to become short-sighted than children of European uh, ethnicity. Um, but of course, chopstick use is presumably just a, an indicator of your ethnicity rather than being a risk factor in its own right. So if you were to implement a public health policy of banning chopsticks, even though they're might be strongly associated with myopia, unless there are calls, that public health intervention isn't going to have any benefit unless it's a real uh, cause of the death, not just uh, some guilt by association relationship. Um, there's lots and lots of evidence over even 100 or 200 years showing a link between uh, more education and a higher level of myopia. But what's been less clear is whether short-sighted children are more studious or whether it's something about uh, the near work or the environment of being in school that causes uh, myopia. So ideally, we'd use the gold standard method of a randomized controlled trial to test this hypothesis, but unfortunately that's not going to be easy ethically because to change a child's level of education would be um, pretty devastating potentially. So we have to try and find some other way to, to tackle this, this question. So thinking about the design of a randomized uh, control study, we have a control group and a treatment group. Um, we wondered, is there another um, variable we could look at to assign children to different levels of education? So we thought about the various things that influence uh, how many years children spend in education. And you can imagine things like class size, bullying, all these things might be important, um, parental education level, etc. But um, perhaps surprisingly, genetics plays a role in this as well. And the genetic makeup of a child can explain around 17% of the inter-child variation in years spent in education. So nobody really understands exactly how those gene variants are working, but it could be on things like attention span, things like that. Um, and then in the context of something called Mendel's second law of inheritance, which Mendel's second law is that genes are inherited independently uh, during meiosis. So in terms of education, we can think about that as being a 50-50 chance for a parent passing on a do well at school gene. So a strange concept, but this genetic influence over education suggests they really are genes that influence whether a child does well or not so well at school. So coming back to our randomized controlled trial design, excuse me, we can imagine the do well at school gene in a parent being randomly assigned to their children 
with a 50-50 chance and a child who doesn't get the do well at school gene variant has a very, very slightly lower educational aptitude than a child that does inherit that particular uh, genetic variant. And again, I should stress that these gene variants associated with that education really do have very, very tiny effects, but they are, they are real. And so these children who get, who don't get the do well at school gene will just have their average level of education. Those who do get this particular gene variant will get a very, very slightly increased exposure to years of education. And then we could compare the level of myopia between these two groups. Now, because these education gene variants have tiny effects, we need to look at a huge sample in order to specifically look at the average effects over literally thousands of participants. So we turn to UK Biobank, which is uh, the largest study in the world for looking at this kind of question and um, is a major, major resource around the world for genetic studies. And we looked at 74 gene variants that are robustly associated with uh, years spent in education. And as shown in the graph to the right, this blue line indicates there is a consistent relationship between um, education predisposition from a genetic, genetic point of view and refractive error. And when we print the numbers, we find that each year of education is associated with a about a quarter of a dot uh, um, shift towards a more myopic refractive error. So considering a child that starts school at age five, goes on to university and finishes around age 21, those 16 years of education accumulatively might produce about four doctors of myopia. And that would be on average. So some children might get a lot more, some a lot less, but it could be that if this um, result really is true, um, the education is a major um, cause of a lot of the myopia we see in, in modern society. So education generally has very positive benefits to health um, in terms of less smoking and lots of other um, benefits to health and well-being, but unfortunately it does seem to have this adverse effect. Unfortunately, the type of study we've done here doesn't give us any clue as to how education might be um, having this adverse effect. It could be that uh, just not being outdoors, perhaps, as you're in school, could be um, part of the answer. Um, so we need to do more research to try and um, dig down to why education has this effect. Um, we have a question that says, surely it's close-up work, not the actual education. I, I can well imagine it could well be uh, near work, but where people have tried to quantify levels of near work that children do and look at how short-sighted they become, it's always been a fairly weak relationship, whereas this relationship with education per se is, is stronger. So we're not really sure what we should be measuring. Is it the amount of time studying? Is it the working distance? Some children get very close up to a page when they work. Uh, is it the amount of time they work without a break? We really aren't sure exactly what we should be measuring. Again, there's some studies saying that some classrooms, the lighting where the lighting in the classroom is poor, the effect on myopia is worse. So again, there are lots and lots of factors that we need to try and um, test to try and, try and work this out. Do you know how many people in the UK have MMD? Uh, I, I don't, but I can give you a very rough calculation. So around one to two percent of people in the UK have high degree myopia. And by the time you get to your 80s or 90s, there's about a 30 to 50 percent chance of having some degree of um, macular disease 
due to myopia. So 30 to 50% of 1% to 2% over somebody's lifetime. That's it. Um, we did get one question in about um, genetics just before the, uh, the or gene therapy. Um, so have the genes been established um, which creates the condition and is there anything, any research going into what can be done with the genes to um, sort of fix them effectively? Yeah, um, so there are two types of genetic uh, influence on myopia. As I mentioned, there are some families where a little bit like Starbucks disease or Labour's congenital amaurosis, you might get a single um, mutation that causes the high myopia. Um, and in those families, gene therapy would certainly be an option, although to date there hasn't been any research or clinical trials testing a gene therapy for, for that kind of myopia. But in the general population, um, genetics seems to work through thousands of genes, each with a tiny effect rather than um, one big mutation that comes in and has a, an all or nothing effect. So we see most researchers like myself working on myopia genetics, we see um, genetics as providing susceptibility and then the environment has the, the trigger effect. So some people seem to be genetically predisposed, some people seem to be genetically resistant, but it's the environment somehow that triggers the eye to, to grow. And, um, and a couple of other questions that came in um, were around stem cell research. And, and if I don't ask this question, I'll get chased down the street. Uh, so uh, is, is uh, the stem cell research, the, like for, for, for example, like uh, the age-related macular degeneration, is there stem cell research uh, underway for myopia or the, or the relationship to macular disease through myopia? So again, um... I say myopia research in that, in that um, for the maculopathy side of things is really lagging way, way behind conditions like AMD. So nobody that I know is looking at uh, stem cell therapy, um, certainly not in the UK for, for myopia. Um, again, in terms of childhood myopia, it's hard to see how stem cells would, would play a role there either. But if stem cell therapy is developed for other maculopathies, again, it might be possible to, to bring that in and use that for patients that have myopic maculopathy in the same way that anti-VEGF treatment, for example, has been successful. Brilliant. Well, I'm sure there's lots of questions that uh, people have uh, wanted to ask, and we'll go through the chat and see if we've missed any. Um, and you've been kind enough to say that you would um, answer uh, some of them and, and get them back to us. So I'll send you a, a list of questions after, after this event when we've sort of collated them. Thank you. And then we'll, we'll find some way of getting them out to, to everywhere. We we'll might post them on our website or something like that. We'll look at how, how to do that. Um, so, so Professor Guggenheim, thank you very much for your, for your time today. That was very, a really interesting uh, chat, uh, a, talk, a presentation. Um, I'll have a little chat with uh, with Jerry now before I, I before we sign off the uh, um, some webinar. So on on behalf of everyone, thanks very much, and uh, and if you just bear with us while we have just a quick chat with Jerry, and then we'll, uh, we'll we'll sign off if that's okay. So so um, Jerry, how are you? How did you find that? Hi, sorry, just had to wait a second to be unmuted. <laughs> um, hi, yes, thank you very much for that. That's brilliant. Um, I learned some new things. I, I try and keep on top of uh, what's going on in all the different types of um, macular disease, um, but I, I'm always learning something new every week. So thank you very much for that. Um, really, I, I suppose I just wanted to say, um, emphasise that the Macular Society funds research on macular disease. Um, and we are open to fund research on any type of macular disease, so including myopic macular degeneration. Um, unfortunately, we can only fund what people put in grant applications for and I very much want to encourage the research community to send us in grant applications that, that we can consider um, in this area. Um, either that be on relating to slowing down the progression in childhood or, or treatments for adults. Um, 
it is an underfunded area as far as I can see compared to something like AMD. Um, I mean, eye research in general is underfunded, unfortunately, um, and we are trying to change that. Um, and we are a very significant funder of eye research and um, macular, macular disease within the UK. Um, but um, at the moment, we, we don't have any projects, unfortunately, but it's, a, it's an area that, that is growing um, in terms of the number of people affected by it. And we certainly see it's an area that we really want to get into. And uh, so uh, we had a couple of questions. Uh, how, how We have a, um, a database, don't we, for people that would like to take part in, in trials. So how, how do they get, will people get onto that? Yes, we call it the research participant database. So this is for people who would like to hear about opportunities to take part in clinical research. Um, we are often approached by people um, running clinical trials um, to help with the recruitment um, of volunteers. And um, if they do that, um, we look on the database, we, we can look and see um, whether you've got wet AMD, dry AMD, uh, macular dystrophy or, or myopic uh, macular degeneration. Um, and we can select people off the database. And what we do is we send them information about the trial. Um, we don't give their names to, to the researchers. Um, and on receiving that information, if you think you want to volunteer, then you get in touch with the researchers direct. Um, so that, that's how it works. It's our research participant database. Um, there is a form on our website in the research section if you're interested in doing that. Brilliant. Well, that's, uh, I, as, as you say, I've uh, I found today uh, very interesting. As, as you say, I've, I've learned a lot too. Um, that's great. Uh, so I think we've, we've come to a close, I think. So, um, as I said, Jeremy was as, as, as kindly offered to to answer any questions. Um, if you so, if you haven't sent any, we'll have a look on on the list. Um, there's lots, I think. There's lots, so we'll uh, we'll we'll send them over, and uh, I'm sure there's we'll collate them and send uh, sort of the top line ones, and um, I hope you'll get some answers from Jeremy at some point, um, which is great. So, oh, that, that only leaves for me to say thanks very much uh, for joining the the session today. Uh, there will be the dreaded evaluation. Uh, uh, will be coming out and I, I shall email it to everybody uh, next week so uh, if you would be kind enough to fill that in um, and then we can get some good feedback to see how we to uh, how we can improve this um, yeah please be as honest as you as you like because uh, we need to learn how to do this uh, as an organization so please feel free to be as honest as you like um, and uh, apart from that have a, a good rest of the day if it's sun oh, if it will we send the slide are we able to share the slides? I, I, I think uh, I'll have a chat with uh, the professor about that, but I'm sure um, at some point they'll become available. Yes. So I'll have a chat with him when, when he's prepared to uh, let, them, we make, let them become available. Um, well, so there we go. So um, if it's sun shining where you are, please enjoy the evening. Uh, and um, and uh, don't forget that the virtual annual conference is on the 12th of uh, September. I nearly said December then, the 12th of September. Um, and you'll be able to log in through the website and there's more information about that will, will appear um, going on for the next few weeks. Um, so have a, have a great afternoon. Thanks for joining us.